Beloved and friends, you are made by God to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. That is the purpose for creation. That is the purpose of redemption. That is the reason you live and move and have your being. And there is one, singularly one, final obstacle to your purpose, to the glory of God and to the joy in Christ. That one obstacle is sin. And it will cloud our thinking, it will cloud our feeling. And God has revealed a purpose and plan, an entire redemptive history so that you could know and you could bring glory to him. And in that, you could find everlasting joy. I ask everyone in the room, command your feelings. Command your thoughts. These are sacred things that are far too wonderful for us. There really is a a most unsuspected glory that fills the room in which we now enter. We are entering into truly one of the most climactic periods, the points within the whole of redemptive history. This is, this is amazingly sacred time and space that we're looking into. We will hear the words of Jesus in his very last supper as he has come not only to the earth but to his own people Israel. And as he has ministered, and as he has resolutely brought them to Jerusalem, with none of them understanding for the purpose that he would be murdered. Last week, we considered Judas under the best teaching, exposed to the most profound supernatural miracles had the greatest light that anyone has ever been gifted to behold. And he chose to turn away. My prayer is that everyone in this room would choose to turn even now looking to Christ. We gather in this place, beloved and friends, not for what we receive primarily. We gather in this place to offer worship. Let's do that now. Would you look at verse 19, please? The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Well, now they're in a room, a room designated for this most sacred of time and space, and an unsuspected glory fills it. The whole passage is glowing. This whole testimony is glowing. It's a momentous occasion, and I dare say it's transcendent. The magnitude here cannot be measured by our feelings. We we strain to just Taste the tip of the iceberg. Jesus said in Luke's account, in Luke twenty two fifteen, 15, that I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This is something he has earnestly desired. I wonder how many of us have earnestly desired to enter into this room in heart and mind. Well, 
It is the Passover. The Passover that they're celebrating. So, for us to understand, I want to invite you on a history trip. Let's go back to Exodus. We'll come back to Matthew, but let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. Second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 12. And let's just rehearse together. Let me lead by reading exactly what is the Passover and what was to be what was to be prepared, celebrated, commemorated. We begin in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. Meaning their calendar would start now. That's how sacred this is. It's to mark their time. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Verse 3. Tell the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb, according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, and shall make your count for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. They do not, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever you shall keep it as a feast and now drop down to verse 26 with me please and when your children say to you what do you mean by this service you shall say it is the sacrifice of the lord's passover for he passed over the houses of the people of israel in egypt when he struck the egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. May we do the same. The Passover was the central commemoration, ritual, and celebration of God's redemption. The most sacred, high, holy day for the congregation of Israel. A feast full of symbolism, full of meaning. 
The point was, only by that blood would God spare any. Well, now, let's go over to chap- Matthew chapter 5. And let's remember what Jesus said in his opening words in his first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, at least. He says, very near the beginning of that sermon, verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law, which is what we just read, the Torah. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the pro- or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. Jesus, in Matthew 26, we looked at last week, he, he is sovereign. He has said, let there be darkness. He has stepped into this darkness. He is orchestrating and directing the pieces, the machinery in the darkness. Nothing's a surprise to him. He is not a victim. He is marching forward in the valley of the shadow of death. His disciples have not a clue what's coming. The proud schemes of his enemies are at work. And what he is doing, he's fulfilling. He is fulfilling all that was promised. And what he does by setting in motion this darkness, by triggering that he knows what Judas is doing, that is the straw that snapped the machinery. That is the trigger that pulled and set it on motion. That is where the betrayal began. That is where everything started. He waited until the supper. And then when he released and triggered it all, well, it's because this will be the very central fulfillment of his coming. This is the central fulfillment of Christ's coming. I want to remind us just briefly, two strokes, everything you've read in Matthew up to this point, from Matthew 1 all the way to Matthew 26, especially as you read through the narrative and what Jesus teaches, please let's get this clear in our hearts and minds. That number one, Jesus does tell his disciples to go and preach good news, but that good news does not have a cross. It is the good news of the kingdom. It is an ellipsis, meaning He's saying, yes, the ultimate goal will be the kingdom. He doesn't describe the way to get it. He just simply says, follow me. Just follow me. They don't know that following him will lead to a bloody cross. And that will unlock the mystery. But to this point, beloved and friends, it's still a mystery. He has said, yes, there's a gospel. But it's not the gospel that we preach Because that gospel is incomplete. It is still unknown. It is still the mystery. He has told them, I speak in parables because the mystery of the kingdom of heaven has been revealed to you. And yet they still don't understand. My first point, very plain, is he has talked to them about the gospel, but they don't understand the cross. He has talked to them, number two, about his death. He has repeatedly prophesied, I'm going to be killed. But again, again, beloved and friends, they don't understand. In fact, he has not once made a connection between the gospel, the good news, and his death. He's not made that connection yet at all. So you hear him saying, go preach the gospel of the kingdom. You hear him saying, I'm going to be killed. But he never connects the two. Also, and lastly, as an observation, we need to understand that when he talked about his death, that I'm going to be crucified, he gave no explanation of its meaning. Why would he be crucified? Why would Jesus have to die? 
Let me just remind you just briefly, I'm going to run through these quickly. Matthew 15, 16, are you still without understanding? 16, 11, how is it that you failed to understand? Luke 2, 50, they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. John 8, 43, why do you not understand what I say? Luke 9, 44, let these words sink into your ears. The son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, but they did not understand this. John 10, 6, the figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. John 12, 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and they had been done to him. And lastly, John 13, 7 Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now in this upper room as he washes their feet, but afterward you will understand. What is the key? I think the keynote of the gospel of Matthew that we should see is going to be first 123, that he shall be named Emmanuel, God with us. And second, 121. You shall call his name Yeshua, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, how? The angel announces his name should be this and declares this is why he's going to save his people from their sins and no one in Matthew knows why or how. How is he going to do that? They don't know. And up to this point, the reader doesn't know. They didn't understand. Are you with me? All right. We had to do that. We had to set the table to understand this table that we're going to look at. We had to realize that they didn't understand what was going on and what we are now entering into, Matthew chapter 26, is going to be for the very, very first time, Jesus is going to explain his death and he's going to connect it to the kingdom. He's going to tie together and unlock the mystery for the first time. And he chose to do it in this Passover meal. It's profound. He does it with more than words. He doesn't rely just on words and commentary to explain it. Instead, I think there's a divine, powerful movement In fact, would you look with me briefly, Matthew 26, look at verse 20. There's a profound movement wherein God is coordinating Passover and passion. He is orchestrating and he is aligning events in history so that Christ would unlock the mystery, bring the understanding of his death exclusively in this moment, Passover. I don't believe that it's accidental, coincidental, or incidental. I think it's expositional. The the issue here, why he chose to say these things in this supper is to explain with more than words. They say pictures are worth a thousand words. We've got a few thousand going here. Well, to help us with this, I want to refer to the Mishnah. Now, I want to make this very, very clear. The Mishnah is not scripture. It's not authoritative. It's the oral tradition of the Jews. I don't bring it to you as I bring the scriptures to you. I only share these particular statements because they have some historic value. And it is very likely, given that these were compiled in between 100 and 210, And they were compiled of an oral tradition accounting the customs and accounting the ritual observances 
of the time of Jesus. So given that they do account these things, they are helpful. It very well may be, and there are variations, I grant that, but let's just, for, for the sake of simplicity, it very well may be that the order of the liturgy, the order of the Passover meal, followed very closely to what the Mishnah describes the Jews practiced for Passover. I will be quoting out of the Babylonian Talmud, the translation by Jacob Neusner, if you're interested. Well, look at Matthew 26, verse 20. It says, when it was evening, he reclined at the table or with the twelve. And that was a custom that had developed among the Jews after the first Passover because they reclined as a statement that they are free men. Only free men reclined. They were slaves and now it's been accomplished. And so they would commemorate the first Passover by reclining as a statement that they are now free. Now, to begin with, the, the Passover meal would start, according to the Mishnah, and I'm going to quote out of Peshach, the, the section, the chapter on the Passover, chapter 10, verse 1. And it says this, on the eve of Passover, and it says other things, and then it says, they should provide him with no fewer than four cups of wine. Hold your place in Matthew. Go back to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. Second book of the Bible, chapter 6. They make a big deal about these four cups of wine. They seem to be the, the markers for the meal. You'll notice in Exodus 6, verse 5, there are four commands or four promises that the Lord himself reveals that he will do in this Passover. Look at these four promises, starting in verse 5. Moreover, I have heard, this is the Lord speaking, I've heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, here they are, I am the Lord, and number one, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Number two, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And number three, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Verse seven is number four. And I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. We can go back to Matthew now, Matthew 26. So those four I wills, promises, establish in the Jewish tradition four cups. The four cups of the meal. The first cup is given in chapter 10, verse 2 of the Mishnah. And that first cup is called the cup of sanctification. Because the Lord said, I will bring you out. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. So sanctification means cut and separated, brought out of. I will bring you out. So the Mishnah states, when they have mixed the first cup of wine, this starts the dinner, the first cup of wine, and this is done by the host, the father of the family. In this case, it would be Jesus. And he would start with his first cup of wine and he would recite what's called the Kadesh. In Hebrew, that means holy, the separate, separation. He would recite the Kadesh in something like this, as tradition holds, blessed art thou, blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth from the vine. You know, Luke chapter 22, verse 17, actually gives us two cups. He says that Jesus started the meal with a cup and then later has another cup. So it very well may be this cup that's described. This would also be the timing after taking that first cup, the timing of the first ceremonial washing of the hands where that pot of water 
would be used, and they would ceremonially wash. It is very likely, and scholars agree, this would be the time of John 13, 3, where Jesus rose from the table and took off his outer garment and took that water and not only washed his hands, but washed their feet. And then, following that, according to the Mishnah, it would be the first dipping. There were two dippings this night, where you take the unleavened bread and you would dip it into the sauce. This would be the first. And at that first dipping, then, chapter 10, verse 3, says, again of the Mishnah, that this is when they would bring in the lamb. And the lamb would be brought in before the bread was broken. And it says, specifically in verse 3, and in the time of the temple, they, in other words, the Mishnah was written after that, they're saying when the temple was here, they would bring before the host the carcass of the Passover offering. And it's at that time they would begin to eat the lamb. Now, verse 4 of the Mishnah again moves on to the second cup. And it states, They mixed for him, the host, a second cup of wine. And here the son asks his father questions. But if the son has not got the intelligence to do so, the father teaches him to speak by pointing out How different is this night from all other nights? You see how they got that right from Exodus 12. Well, this second cup is called the cup of deliverance because in Exodus it says, I will deliver you from slavery. So here they have the lamb. The lamb has given its blood and that blood has redeemed them and now they're being delivered. They're being delivered through, as it were, picturing the the Red Sea, and now they comment on these things. They explain it. The son should ask, and the father should explain it. And it's at this time that the obligation of the what's called the Haggadah, the Haggadah is the explanation of the whole ceremony. And the, this explanation would take place right here. So the Mishnah 10.5 begins to explain what is necessary. And it says, whoever has not referred to these three matters connected to the Passover has not fulfilled the obligation. What are they? They are these. The Passover lamb, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs. Those are the three mentioned in Exodus 12. And it's at this time you have the second dipping with the bitter herbs. It may well be that it was at this time that in Matthew 26, we find verse 20 to 25, where Jesus identifies the bitterness of the one who betrays him. It is at this time in the Haggadah that the host will explain the lamb, explain the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread, and then drink the second cup. Well, verse 21 says, And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. It might well be right there. The next step in the supper is described by the step of redemption. Don't miss this. In the Mishnah 10.6, it says that the second washing is to be performed. The host is to break the bread and to pronounce a blessing. Something like, blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Now look with me at verse 26. Now as they were eating... Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. Stop there. That fits exactly with what the Mishnah describes as the order of the Jewish Passover. 
After they were done eating the lamb, now would be the time to take the bread, to break it, and to give a blessing. It's the word we get eulogy from. It means to speak well of, to praise. And it's a parallel to the word that's used in the next verse for the cup. And it's eucharistia, which is where you get the word eucharist. And it means to give thanks. So Jesus blessed the Father, not the bread, despite what it seems to suggest in the English. He blessed the Father like, blessed art thou, O Lord our God. And also 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four corroborates and says, when he had given thanks, he broke the bread. So we know that that was to the Father. Now, the Mishnah helps us out to see some more dimension that very well might be intended, or at least the disciples may have had in their heart's mind as they have exercised this every year of their life. And the things that they would have been schooled in are things like this. Mishnah 10, 6, when the host concludes, and I quote, with a formula of redemption, not until you get to the bread. A formula of redemption. And he concludes his prayer by saying, Blessed are you, Lord, who has redeemed Israel. They also go on to say that the unleavened bread must be lifted up. They also go on to say that that, uh, Rabbi Bar Shila describes this, that the end of the blessing in the prayer is, Who causes the horn of salvation to spring forth? And that at the prophetic lection is shield of David. In other words, they introduced a messianic anticipation at the bread. Because it was the description of redemption. And so look with me again at verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And that's amazing. Even if the Mishnah is not what they practiced to the T, even if it didn't have all the overtones of messianic anticipation, calling the bread to remember David, even without it, the whole point of the passage is Jesus is in the Passover, a 1,500-year object lesson, the most graphic and vivid, intense commemoration of God's redemption. And he turns the symbols to point to him. And he says, everything that you've ever known about Passover I find it stunning when he says, this bread, let me, let me explain why. Because it's, he waits to the Haggadah. He waits to the time where you explain the elements to then explain, they point to him. I mean, this is colossal. His death is the central key to relationship with God. We'll see that in just a moment. Jesus is commemorating, remember, the central greatest act of redemption in history. The meal itself told the story. And those who participate are in celebration of God redeeming people. And in that moment, Jesus reserved this moment for his very last Passover, for this very moment for him to say the greatest mystery of my mission, the greatest purpose of my coming was to reveal myself through these elements that you would learn through the picture of the Passover what the meaning of my death So, Mishnah 10.7, not coincidentally, has the very next step in the supper, and it happens to be the third cup. And the Mishnah states that the third cup was the most significant of all the cups. (laughs) 
This cup corresponded to the third promise in Exodus 6, which says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Mishnah 10.7 says, mix the third cup for the host, and then he says the blessing for the food. Blessed art thou, O Lord God, King of the universe. He brings forth fruit from the vine. It is fascinating that this third cup is the cup of redemption, the cup of blessing, as elsewhere called. And it, by some standards written by the Mishnah, it represented the blood of the Passover lamb. In fact, when it says in the instructions of 10.7 to mix the third cup with water, the water was heated so that it would be warm. It would appear, again, that this is to represent the blood of the lamb, because it was the blood of the lamb that redeemed, bought them their life. <laughs> well, that blood was key to the judgment of God passing over them. Look at now with me at Matthew 26, 27. The very next step in the supper that we see them practicing is exactly in accord with this order. And he took a cup. Luke would tell us this is another cup, not the first cup. And then here, Matthew says, And when he had given thanks, which is in the same order, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do you see the significance of representing a cup of redemption, modeling blood, Jesus taking the symbol of a 1,500-year wait and says, this is pointing to me. In Exodus 24, 7, it says that then Moses took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people and they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient and they weren't. And later God will call them on it and said, you have failed your covenant to me but Jesus is the only one who has fulfilled it. And so the very next verse, Exodus 24, 8 Right after seven, he says, and Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And Hebrews 9 verse 18 explains this whole situation. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when, ev when every cov or commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. But beloved and friends, would you turn to Jeremiah with me, please? Jeremiah chapter 31. I want you to note something significant in what Jesus describes when he says, this is the blood of the covenant in my blood, in, in my blood. This is the cup of the covenant in my blood. That we see the connection of the blood here more than just a sealing of a covenant. I want you to see it as the prophet Jeremiah describes it. Jeremiah 31 Verse 31, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. That was the Exodus 24 covenant. Not like that one, because why, Jeremiah, why? With their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they, tell me, broke. Though I was their husband, God was faithful, and they were unfaithful. And as a consequence of that infidelity, the covenant was broken. And so God promised, I'm going to make a new covenant. 
And this new covenant is going to be greater. Why? Supremely because the old covenant lacked the power to forgive sin. The old covenant lacked the power to restore the adulteress. The old covenant lacked the power to reconcile the estranged and apostate to God. In the old covenant, an adulteress was punished with murder or with killing, execution. Here, look at verse, if you're in Jeremiah 31 with me, look at verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. He's talking about a new person inside, the new birth inside. And he says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. What's the purpose of regeneration? It's fellowship with God, relationship with God, reconciliation with God. But how? How can you get there? How can you get there when you've sinned? How can you realize your purpose to glorify him and enjoy him forever when your sin has separated you? Well, drop down to verse 34, or it's right next verse. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Jesus would say, and this is eternal life, that they know you and me. And then he says, For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Beloved and friends, don't miss this. The way that anyone comes to know God is through their sins being taken away. If you have sin and have not been atoned, covered, reconciled, you cannot know God. So the new covenant promises, and by the way, there are eight covenants made in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. Eight covenants made or promised, and there's only one, only one that forgives sins. It's the new covenant. Only one. And what is a covenant? Well, it is a sealing and a binding of commitment relationship, isn't it? It's between two parties, two people. Above all, it speaks of relationship. Above all, it it speaks of protecting and sealing love. Jesus is saying that through his death, a new relationship is made possible between God and man. A sinner, otherwise guilty and condemned to an eternal separation from God, through the death of Jesus is made right with God, reconciled to God, justified before God, and brought fully to him in love. Covenant is a word of love. It's a word of love because it's about relationship that has nothing separating you. Being realized, this whole Glorious promise of the new covenant can only be realized not by works, not by a person's desert, not by a person making themselves worthy to be accepted, but the entire promise of the new covenant is something that would be received by faith in something God did. And now Jesus takes a cup and says, here it is, what God is doing out of love to reconcile you and keep you forever. Let me make this plain. Every benefit, every blessing, every hope of the new covenant depends on the blood of Christ. Every benefit. Back in our text, in Matthew 26, Jesus says three distinct things I want us to catch. He says about this, he says it's the blood of the covenant, my blood of the covenant. He says it's poured out, and then he says it's poured out for many, and then he says it's for the forgiveness of sins. I want to start with the poured out. When he says poured out, it's my blood poured out. Some, I understand the intent, and, and some commentators and sermons I've heard talk about that, that's pictures what? What does that picture? The blood poured out. What does that picture? They, they say it pictures a, a violent, gruesome death, like splattering of blood, like, like 
the violence of it. I'm not convinced. After spending more time in the text and thinking more carefully about it, and, and going to search, what does, that, what does that little word mean in this context? It actually is a word that's used of, of, of basically a drink offering. Let me give you two examples. In Philippians 2.17, Paul says, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering. Or 2, 2 Timothy 4.6, he says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. What does it mean? To be poured out means that it's an official, sacrificial presentation of the offering. When you took the, the offering of a cup and you would pour it out on the altar, the pouring out is the presentation to God. It speaks of its acceptability, its efficacy, its power, its, its completion. When he says that he's poured, his blood is poured out, he is picturing my blood will be presented to the Father on your behalf. It is a sacrificial offering to God. And the, and the, the fact that he stresses this difference between the body and the blood and he keeps them separate, that itself is something that is in Exodus. The, the, sacrifice, the sacrifices, even in Leviticus, the sacrifices had to be separated. The blood had to be separated from the sacrifice. The blood had to be sprinkled separate from when the flesh had to be burned. And this is all incredibly clear to the Jewish mind at Passover. Jesus is saying, I am the sacrifice. And I will, in my death, present to God what is acceptable. This is why Hebrews 9.15 would say, Therefore, he is the mediator, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. So a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. That's Hebrews 9.15, word for word, explaining the whole situation. Then a couple of verses later, verse 22, he says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, that is the presentation of it to God, there is no forgiveness of sins. And then a few verses later, he says in chapter 10, verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. He just walked us through why the old covenant is inferior, why the new covenant is superior. He just showed us. The, the old covenant required blood sacrifices, but they could never take away the sin. So inherent in the promise of a new covenant that gives forgiveness would be a better blood. It says for many. The first thing I said was that it's poured out. The second thing is that it's for many. And I'll just briefly, briefly note this. He uses peri in Greek, which can be concerning, uh, and it can also be used as a substitute, like it is in Hebrews 5, 3, and Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, where it's describing on behalf of. The for many means my blood will be offered to God as an acceptable sacrifice, perfect on behalf of many. On behalf of many. And what is the many? Well, I think if you're sitting in a Passover meal as a Jew, you don't ask the question, what does many mean? You know, the many is any and everyone who believed what was said by God and took the blood and put it on the door and got inside. Everyone inside, believing the blood will protect, they're the many. Let me just give you Isaiah's account, speaking of the suffering servant. Isaiah 53, 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied, and his knowledge shall the, and by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he goes on in verse 12 to say, he bore the sin of many. That's the many. 
All who would place their trust in Christ. So we've considered these three most comprehensive. Listen to this. What Jesus just gave us is the most comprehensive explanation of his death in the entire gospel of Matthew. The most comprehensive explanation of his death. He just described this as the blood of the covenant. Like the prophet Isaiah 40, 42, 6, talking about the coming Messiah. I will give you, Messiah, as a covenant for the people to be a light to the nation. He's the covenant one. He's told us that he, it's poured out. His blood is poured out for many. Like Matthew 20, verse 28, where it says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He has told us not only is he has the blood of the covenant, not only is that its blood is poured out for many, but that it is for the forgiveness of sins. Like you shall call him Yeshua. Because he will save his people from their sins. The first time in Matthew, we get it. It connects. It's through his death, he'll save us. It's through a substitution. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Finally, we know why he will suffer. And it's through the picture of the Passover. And there's a striking contrast, and I must close this, because it doesn't end there. The, The dinner has one more cup left. There's the cup that Exodus calls, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. It's called the cup of consummation or the cup of praise. And this final cup, Jesus has something to say about it. Look at what he says. It's very likely he may be referring to this fourth cup when he says, verse 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day. And I get this mainly because of his stress on a certain point in the future. Until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. (gasps) Beloved and friends, do you remember what Revelation says? Revelation chapter 21 says this, that behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Behold, I, the lamb, am making all things new. And he says, I'm not gonna gonna drink the cup of that until I bring the kingdom to earth. Well, the Mishnah actually, and by the way, Luke tells us, Jesus says, I'm not going to do that until it's fulfilled. The Mishnah says in relation to the fourth cup that it, is the reversal of the curse. It describes it as, and they quote Genesis 3.17, that in toil you will eat, but that the fourth cup reminds them that there's coming a day where it won't be in toil. But instead, Amos 9.13, uh, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed, and the mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. That's the day I'll drink it with you. Beloved and friends, I want you to see this is when verse 30 happens. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. To the Jews, the details would have been vivid and powerful. You might ask, well, how come the Bible doesn't explain all the other cups and the, 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 all the other order? Well, at least one consideration would be the Holy Spirit of God was pleased to make certain that we understood this specifically in the elements of Christ's redemption and not perpetuate a Jewish ritual. That this is a transcendent fulfillment of the old 
and the birth of a new dawn. And therefore, Christians, it's not our business to be detailed concerned about all the elements in a Passover meal. It's our business, our worship, our duty, our love, our joy to be most concerned about the bread that represents the body and the cup that represents the blood that saves our soul forevermore. I dare say that this is an issue of the shadow to the substance. And let me bring us to the cup with these few thoughts. This old ritual now has a new reality. The Last Supper became the Lord's Supper. and The light of the world is shining entire new meaning on an old model. What we have before us is a 1,500-year shadow that's going away. And now the substance emerges for all to see. This is, I believe, what Jesus said in Matthew 13, 52, when he described, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out old from his treasure and what is new from his treasure. Jesus reveals a gloriously new substance from the old symbol, and he shows fulfillment and establishment, like in the the, a new exodus, you know, when he says, I call my son out of Egypt in chapter two, that's Jesus. When he goes into the wilderness, like Israel went into the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus goes for 40 days. Chapter four, that's Jesus. But now a profound twist, because now it's not just that he's, he's the new Moses or he's the new David or he's the new Solomon or he's, or he's the greater any other person. Now he's the sacrifice. He's the lamb. He's the lamb. The lamb of God is used 30 times over in the New Testament. And let me give you one last verse and explain the shadow and we'll go to participate. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Please write that down. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. There is no question that the authority of Scripture wants every believer to understand that in this meal, Jesus says the symbols find fulfillment, and point to me. So the shadow gives way to the, to the substance. Like it says in Colossians 2.16, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or regarding festivals or new moons or Sabbath. These are shadows of the things to come. And the substance belongs to Christ. The substance belongs to Christ. Let me um, close in prayer and then we will participate and I'll explain how we'll do this today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the grace you've shown us and the details of this Last Supper. And I ask now for the grace that we need for our hearts to rightly respond in song, and participation, truly for your glory and our joy. In Christ's name, amen.